Hey guys, welcome to the end of the year. <laughs> welcome to the end of the year. That's a good one. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on uh, episode 42. So we almost did 52 weeks, except 10. So um, I don't even know why I even said that. You know what? Just, just welcome to the show. Um, of course, <laughs> with me are our usual host, Sam. Um, and of course, Mr. Juan Bagnell. How's it going, guys? Hello. Hello. Great. Good, good. So we are back. Uh, we had a uh, Christmas break. Um, everyone's here except uh, Warren's trying to get in. Um, and this show is going to be lean, clean, and um, uh, lots of stuff. So I was wondering if we should talk about the Apple fiasco as we tie it into a lot of the our big uselessnesses of the year. So guys, if you have any in the chat, do submit that. Um, we have, of course, a couple of options, but I guess we could start with Apple and then we can yeah. continue with other things. So um, Apple finally came out and admitted that they have been slowing down your iPhones for years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, due to, I mean, it, it, the whole battery thing and all that, and Apple came out, just to summarize it, and I don't want to give me a better definition because I just looked in and said, Apple came out and said, hey, you know what, we're sorry we did this, and you can now replace those batteries, and instead of it costing you 50 bucks, it will cost you 29. Oh, and I think the battery replacement was 80? Yeah, sorry, 80, sorry, it will cost you $29, right? Um, so we're giving you a discount of around $50 or so, something like that. Um, so my own reaction is, what the fudge? Seriously, like, that shouldn't cost me anything. You should just replace it. And you should get sued, which is what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, it's, it's tricky. I understand why a battery replacement still costs something. But what we're talking about is a company that's flush with liquid assets, trying to make sure that their image is as untarnished as possible, especially for a company that depends so much on their lifestyle branding, mm -hmm. um, outside of just their tech branding. So I, I think it would have been a great goodwill gesture. But even, even for those missteps, we know that there are a number of people out there in the iOS community who are still on phones like the iPhone 5S, and that was the cutoff. Um, so it starts with the iPhone 6 and up <clears throat> that uh, they'll be covering these battery replacements. Just the, I, I think Apple is emblematic, uh, this right here, of a, a major problem that numerous companies had this year, which was disclosure. That there had just been something buried in the terms of service that you agreed to, that humongous document that no one ever reads, that this would be something that they would do to maintain the, sp the stability of their products, then no one would have batted an eye. And most people would probably, not most, but many people would have been echo chambering how this is a good thing that Apple does this. I mean, it was the fact that Apple tried to do this under the radar that made it look like it was something shady. I mean, think about every single time Apple changes something that they don't need to change. You've got all the apologists out there saying like, oh, no, it's good that Apple does this. If, if Apple had just disclosed this from the beginning or had put in like some sort of placebo switch in the settings, you know, mm -hmm. I want the full power of my phone, even if it costs me battery life, um, then I don't think anyone would would have thought that this was a big deal. It, it, it's, it's just the perfect climate right now for people to be sensitive about companies mucking with products and mucking with data and trying to do things in secret that it kind of blew up in Apple's face. I see. I partially disagree. I, I look at this as Apple. I mean, I, not partially. I disagree. You know, I mean, I just <laughs> I, like, no, no, not, not partially. You know, I whole I it, totally disagree. I'm talking. I, I go from partially disagreeing to completely. Yeah. Disagree. I mean, look, Apple, <laughs> Apple to me just downright screwed his customers so they can capitalize on the same base that they have. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Apple purposely slowed down your iPhone so you buy a new iPhone, or at least you spend money within no, the ecosystem. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any of that. What I'm saying is this: the, the problem wasn't the, the behavior. The problem is the disclosure. See, my, my problem is the, I, my problem is the behavior. Anyway. 
But <sighs> if they had just said it up front, Apple fans would have said, well, this is why your Samsung slows down and mine doesn't and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I hear you on that part. My problem is the behavior from the very beginning. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I just don't like, you know? So the disclosure to me is also half-assed, but I'm like, whatever, to the point, like, you already committed evil. Your, your, your evil is just continuing in my mind. For me, it's the fact that they actually went with that process instead of giving, again, this is not a situation uh, okay, where not guys, giving think, iPhone I, I users think, the best iPhones. Let, let, let's take a step back and let, let, let's try that. Let's rephrase the question. Apple admits that it doesn't know how to turn off new features for older devices. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> because that makes the whole excuse bullshit. Okay, you're telling me that the software can't tell the difference between a 7, a 6S, and a 5? Come on. So you slow down the battery for everything that came before just so every feature could work properly? For Christ's sakes, turn off the damn features on the older phones and keep the battery as is. But, but no, Sam, they're I, pushing I, it to sell more phones. Simple. That's, no, that's no, no, all I, 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 I agree with your outcome. I think, I think one, of the, one of the issues that Apple's running into here is... It's not necessarily whether or not new features are more power intensive. It's that as the battery degrades, the chipset, because Apple uses fairly powerful chipsets. They're almost yeah. always a full generation ahead of Qualcomm in terms of just raw processing power. But you look at the smaller iPhone. This is what makes me so cynical about a company like Apple. You look at the smaller iPhone and it's got the bare minimum battery capacity for that phone to last the day when brand new. Yeah, there is no buffer for when that yeah. phone ages, and so as the as a battery degrades, the amount of power it can push out in any given time also gets reduced. So you have to throttle the CPU because the battery might literally not be able to to feed it enough power in the moment that those processors spike. And so this becomes one reason why you might want to upsell from the smaller iPhone to the iPhone Plus. And then even the iPhone Plus, that's kind of a small battery for a phone, for a larger phone. So then over the two years, it's also going to face some kind of reduction in power. It's just probably not going to be quite as severe as the smaller iPhone. And then from there, right around that two year time period where everything's falling apart on that phone, wouldn't you know it, that's when most consumers are looking to shop a new phone. So instead of replacing the battery, going through that hassle, you can just get a whole brand new shiny widget that you can play with. And, and that, that to me is the psychology which is so insidious about how Apple has positioned their products because there's no competition. Mm -hmm. Those people aren't looking to switch teams and go to an Android device. If I'm pissed off at Samsung, I can go LG, HTC, OnePlus, Huawei. I have competition for my ecosystem. Apple has a de facto monopoly on iOS. No, no, I, I definitely agree. I think, I think that, like I said, that goes back to my main point of um, the evil, and I'm going to call it evil, the evil planning of iPhones where Apple basically says, we will create an iPhone with the barest minimum battery so that, like you said, the whole process will lead to you getting, you have to buy another iPhone. Like, it's not that you want to, or you have, like you said, you, like on the Android side where you can go, screw you, Samsung, touch with is just ruining in my life, I'm going to stalk Android or I'm going to Huawei with a big battery, or I'm going to OnePlus with better optimization or whatever have you. Apple says, no, you are our, our uh, pawns, you are our scapegoats. I'm talking to all of you iOS, sorry, iOS <laughs> users out there. I'm sorry, you have been gypped, you have been swindled, you have been called fools because this is what Apple is saying. And some people might say, no, it's a design philosophy. No, it's called planning. This is what companies do. And they've done it the worst way. Now, Samsung could be doing something horrible too. When we find that out, yeah, I'll curse them out too. But at this point well, in time- I, I think, well, no, no, no. We, we can easily call out most Android manufacturers plan obsolescence. If you're on Samsung, then the planned obsolescence is, oh, you want that new software update that Google was trumping? Well, you got to yeah. buy a new phone. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> or wait five years for the update. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's the same. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm, but this, I'm calling out Apple's evil nature for all you iOS. And, oh, man, you went straight to evil, man. Damn. No, yeah, it is, it is. And look, it is, it, to me, it's, it's the most condescending way because you have an ecosystem of uneducated buyers. Yes. Oh. Damn. Well, don't forget. You just went after everyone. 
no, 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 no. I, I mean, th this is this is where I, I I completely agree with that sentiment. Is Apple as a company built part of their new consumer philosophy on? we're going to make it easy it just works we manage these things you don't have to worry about what's going on on your phone you touch square get app everything you know the phone should should blend into the background of your day and so when you cultivate that and then you build a sort of a monopolistic business practice for that entrenched consumer base it becomes really easy to take advantage of those consumers there's too much money involved not to take advantage of that goodwill that you've earned and so, you know, again, this could have been solved by disclosure, uh, pop up in your settings, buried three menus deep saying, well, we had to throttle your phone because your battery has aged to a certain point. And if you'd like the full performance of your phone, you can go to an Apple store and schedule a time with one of our geniuses to to have a battery replacement and will cost you ninety dollars. It's just like an oil change. But they couldn't even do that because the emotional response of the gadget, that's already too much management for what they have been advertising their products as, as, as needing. And so this is going to be another major situation. But I wonder, and I seriously doubt, but I wonder, will this convince anyone not to do business with Apple? Because I think this is going to be another thing people are going to get pissed off about it's going to have a full news cycle then they're going to sort of like grumble about it and then just like removing the headphone jack or getting rid of touch id they're well i guess this is just what i need to do instead of examining their uh their opportunities for doing business with another company that's i i feel like we're going to make a lot of noise about this because we care about the industry and we care about the market and apple fans are going to make a lot of noise for about a minute and then we're going to go back to business as usual I, I definitely agree. Uh, Warren, thanks for joining me, man. Um, what's your thoughts? Uh, it's this on the whole Apple thing? Yeah, the whole uh, the whole battery slow down and, you know, the, the, like so, I said, the evil plan. Uh, I wouldn't call it an evil plan, even though it comes off that way. Um, this is the problem when they don't, like, from a technical standpoint, what they're doing actually makes sense. We're like, oh, we release these software updates. We know we're releasing this on all the devices. All the devices have less battery on them. So maybe we want to do something to make sure we don't kill the experience, but so much to try and make their phones last longer is maybe the technical idea out of clocking down a processor wait, on wait, an older wait. phone. One, one question but, is every, every year, do they change the size of the battery on the iPhone or no? Uh, I don't think it, so. It, it, it has been, no, 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 no. From, from the iPhone 6 to the iPhone 8, it, it has creeped up, but we're talking, I think, between between 3 and 5% in, increases. The as 6S in what? Was, actually, uh, was, was actually, I think, a slightly more significant increase because that's when they started going to quad core. Someone, it might be the 6S or the 7. Okay, so basically, so it's almost the same size battery as far as I'm concerned. It's not past 10% that it doesn't well, matter. Well, and, and, and we're still talking about because they went to that quad core uh quad core a series that they still put in the bare minimum battery capacity for that new powerful phone so people were saying oh we got a bigger battery and you're like no 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 no, no. you have probably the same or less runtime as the phone that came before it because the hardware just got so much more powerful sorry uh warren please continue i just wanted to 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 clarify that <sighs> As I was saying, yeah, <laughs> you guys asked. I was gonna say, uh, from a technical standpoint, it actually makes sense to extend the life of previous devices that you're still supporting software for. The issue becomes is how you present a very technical idea to non technical people, and they this is where they miss Steve Jobs and being able to present this type of information and not come off as complete and utter asses. Oh, I disagree already. And, 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 and they've already come on. And they've already come out of the Let me finish my ideas. point, damn it. That's what happens when you show up late. Sorry. Damn it's it. A... Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. There could have been a better way to present this where the hoopla doesn't go all off. And well, I think Warren's bringing up some great points in this rant right now. I really agree with what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stop, it now. stop cutting Warren up. He's going to go all Warren Postal on you guys. Uh, <laughs> sorry. 
Or is it going to go, let's do this? <laughs> I'm waiting for that. You people like annoy me. strikes in the center. <laughs> you people annoy me. <laughs> Anyways, the... Um, the, the, the way they presented this was just, I was trying to sum up, the way they presented this is just horrible. And like I said, technically, from a technical standpoint, it makes logical sense. Um, it would have been great if they'd have been probably more transparent about why they do that, what's the reasons, and being more up, more upcoming about it, which would have prepared their users to make a decision of either uh, buying either you know buying the new, new phone, knowing that this is going to happen to the phone, maybe choose not to update, or maybe waiting to get a refresh on the battery by going into the Apple Store before they do the update, because maybe Apple could have scored some points by getting some people to actually go into the store to refresh their battery if they known that if their their phone's going to get clocked down because of the battery essentially not having enough juice as it once did before when you initially had it. So they could have lost them. They could have got, gained themselves about maybe 90 or 100 bucks a pop for people that could have been in preparation of trying to extend their phones a little bit longer. So it turns into this whole, look at Apple, I'm not crazy, my phone is slowing down, and these jerks did do this to me, and they do have planned obsolescence, and the narrative just runs away from itself. Is it going to hurt them and damage them in any way? Hell no. These people, the Apple people are Apple people. They will just take what it is. They're mostly too afraid to, to try and change or do anything different because they're just locked into the ecosystem and they're so used to it. So they're just going to follow the sheep and just go with what it was. You'll get a few people. Class action lawsuit will happen. We'll hear next year at some point what the, the word will be about that um, and, and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I think this affects Apple in no real large way is why it's kind of hard to rant on it because it's not gonna it's not gonna be deemed as it's hugely negative you know it's a hugely negative thing to us because we're not drinking the kool-aid but this story already isn't going a fire as it would if samsung was doing this where all the other media outlets would be blowing this up writing every expose pieces they could possibly write about it every video they could possibly talk about this they would do they would they would be completely trying to expose samsung for this because it's on team android but we're all but with team apple and the apple people threaten you know the apple folks out there threatened by their you know their apple privilege and getting phones first because it's things that have happened recently and um they're not going to want to necessarily rock the boat. So that's why, if you notice, how much have we heard about this outside of the few people in the tech space that are not Apple-centric talking about it? You know, and Gadget, I think, posted something, and that's all you're going to hear. Verge posts something, that's all you're going to hear. You're not going to get these lengthy exposés talking about this stuff. And and that's where I feel that it's just not going to affect Apple too much. People are just people that are Apple fans are like, well, I'm not crazy. They are slowing my phone down. And that's the checkbox that they get out of it. Yeah, I agree. Evil company, evil plan, and uh, that's. Just I, I, the, the thing is, I won't call it an. I will not call I, it an I, evil I call, plan. I call it. I call it, it it's it, not. It, it's not. It's not an evil plan because it ends up. It ends up being better off because it could. They could. Because it could. No, just what let, do you mean better well, off? Well, 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 look at it. Th- look no, at it this no, way. No, 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 look no, no, at it this no, way. No, stop, stop that. No, 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 I can't even hear one sentence, man. Okay, I, Warren, to, Warren, Warren, Warren you have 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds, Warren. I'm about Go. to draw some logic on you. The reason that it makes sense, because they could just they could have just allowed that to just be as fast as it was. People phones are running out faster. You need to force them to upgrade sooner, which would have been a lot more evil of a situation. And that's actually far more heavy of planned obsolescence to go, hey, you want the new software? If they yep, we're killing your phone, now you gotta go buy a new one. Instead, the phone extends a little bit longer. They get to keep it for two or three years. They get to keep the resale value on it as well, too, which allows them to then go and buy a new phone at a much cheaper price. That's why I mean, like the evil plan could have been what the Android folks do and just drop the goddamn software on there, screw optimizing it for you uh, for all the devices. And if well, if it L's your battery, it L's your battery. Just go buy something new. 
That's what that's what happens on the Android side of okay, things. Okay, here's the evil plan because you missed it since you showed up late. Very simple. They built a phone with a battery with a bare minimum because the plan is you will have to do this. If you actually gave somebody no, I think a, they, a, a, a what eleven hundred milliamp battery, whatever the tiny ass battery is inside the iPhone and something more useful, you won't run into these problems. Simple. It no, I think they built this I way so that you will buy. Different reasons. Okay, no, 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 no. They put no. Can, I, can they, I finish? Oh, Warren. Yeah. You know yeah. what? It's, let's just move on to another topic. <laughs> they they put smaller batteries in it because it because it, it's better for the bottom line. That's why they put smaller batteries. Bigger batteries cost more, eat more into the profit of the phone. That's why they put the bare minimum. No, it doesn't eat that much. Between it between a twelve hundred and eighteen hundred. Well, we are talking Apple. No no no, 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 no. Talking Apple. No, no, no. This is where I agree with Warren. It, you, like Apple consumers also sort of understand that their product is the best because their company is the most profitable, which means they'll be around longer. And so going from a 1200 milliamp hour battery to a 2000 milliamp hour battery might cost three cents per unit. And so they're looking at the millions of units that they're they're trying to sell. And their only goal here is to provide as much possible value for their shareholders, not pay taxes, and then funnel all of that cash into offshore accounts so that they also don't have to pay taxes while they move their company headquarters from the United States to Ireland so that they'll be charged less taxes, and then they won't even pay those taxes. So if you're going to say that, oh, well, it's only going to cost this much to go from 1,200 to 1,800 milliamp hour, you've already failed for Apple. <laughs> Apple won't pay it. They won't pay it's that. All about it's all about their their company with a lot of a lot of folks out there with current master's degrees in business. It's all about doing the cheapest thing possible to earn the most amount of profit. So if they if they can skimp on anything that they can out there, including freaking headphone jacks, they will do that if it means to equal that it's going to make more money for them to do so. Well, well we're going to spend on, we're gonna spend on all that this money. Note, and then the next generation of phones we put out, we're going to make sure they don't have headphone jacks to well, maximize on our investment of beats. On that note, uh, quick news, Apple is slashing forecast for the iPhone X. Yes, which means less money for them. Thank you very much. Apple is what? To, What'd you say? He's slashing forecast for the iPhone X. So I, from oh, what shit, we can tell, shit, Apple. It was Apple, a man. Apple never really puts out sales numbers, but what we can tell from shipping numbers that the iPhone X actually isn't selling poorly, um, but it is being outpaced by the combination of the iPhone 8. So I, I want to say it's selling better than the iPhone 8 and it's selling better than the iPhone 8 Plus, but the two together are uh, outperforming it. Yeah, but I think this is something that we said already way back when, when this came out. The whole idea of make, making an A and an A plus and then an X at the same time, one is going to take a hit over the other ones. And yes, even if the X is selling more than everyone else, it just makes sense that, you know, combined, the people who don't see a value in paying almost a thousand bucks or paying a thousand bucks for a phone, you know, would outpace people who are willing to shell out that kind of money. It just, just makes sense. You know, I, Apple kind of did this to itself. Yeah. All right. Any more big uselessnesses of the year? We know net neutrality oh, is one. Well, I, I got five, man. I got, <laughs> I, got, I got my five right here. I got my five right here. No, that's five top tech, not useless. Unless you have. No, like, no, no, no. No, these, these are like top tech <laughs> news slash uselessness, man. <laughs> okay. Like for the whole damn year. Okay. Right. Now we're, 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 we're waiting. Oh, we're going to start off with YouTube. Okay. You know, YouTube kids, that whole scandal to me was just like. It, it was an indication that that, that YouTube has probably lost a step. Okay, um, the whole idea that we had the ad apocalypse during the summer, and then all of a sudden we, we realized that what YouTube did to creators for the regular YouTube site was not done to creators for their YouTube kids site. It shows a huge like gap in just analytical skills. Like someone should have thought that maybe what we're doing on our main site should should basically apply across the board. No one really thought about that. So I think that's a, a huge fail on YouTube's, um, YouTube's end. Then I'll, I'll go with Equifax next, OK? Oh, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, Equifax? And then the way to try to fix stuff was to make you pay for stuff as well. Like, hey, we screwed up, but if you pay us some more money, we'll take care of you. Like, oh, well, we got gangster like that, huh? Like, <laughs> look. That vase in your store fell down. If you pay me some more money, nothing like this will happen again. It's like, come on, Equifax. Like, we're not all, like, living in, like, 1960s Chicago, okay? <laughs> and then Facebook, Twitter. 
seriously like this is this is one of the ones that really really kind of um disturbs me a lot right so you have facebook and twitter and you have all these whole fake news allegations right but you have a company like facebook and a company like twitter that boasts like having some of the greatest developers some of the greatest minds on the planet and it's not i'm not over exaggerating saying this is some of the greatest minds on the planet working for these companies and they can't draw a correlation between a payment from russia and an ad that is political in another country. What the f is wrong with these companies? Like Cause seriously. Cause like, they don't look at algorithms. It's just set it and forget but they, it. But their whole company, or these guys' companies, these, their whole business models are driven off of algorithms. So it's like you, you, you're, you're part of a world that you don't really truly understand. And that's a little disturbing because if you can manipulate those platforms, you can manipulate your users. So at the end of the day, the way we think or the way we interact with each other, uh, which with each other can be basically manipulated by foreign entities buying ads on these platforms that we use. And that to me, that that's that's very disturbing. I think I'm at three now, right? Is that four, I think? I think that's, I think that's three. But that was four? Oh, that was four? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then let's get to, to Uber, which I think to me, Uber is the biggest fail of the year. Right when you start off with like Susan Fowler's allegation against um, against Uber for um, sexual harassment, you you go to the whole uh, start of this year that when, when we had the whole delete Uber movement. Um, you have uh, God dang it, this Waymo suing Uber for stealing their technology for self driving cars, and then on top of all of that, towards the end of the year, we find out that Uber had a massive <laughs> data breach, and they just decided not to tell anyone because if we don't tell you, it didn't happen. You know, roll safe. <laughs> <laughs> so we roll know, safe. That, that that was just like there's a reason that I don't use Uber on my daily drive as my daily drive, and I only use it when I travel internationally. Is because I just don't trust that company anymore. I don't trust that they know how to conduct themselves like grownups. I don't trust that they know how to secure my data. I don't trust that they know how to take care of their drivers. I just don't trust them, and. Last but not least, the biggest one of the year, the most disappointing, is net neutrality, man. And it's not just the fact that net neutrality was repealed, it's the fact that Ajit Pai has not sat in front of Congress to explain exactly why, with all the, con all the consumer outrage, with all the you know, uh, senators telling him to hold off on it, why he still repealed the net neutrality. He's got I think that is something he, ha yeah, he, ha he, he has to face Congress for this one. So Hopefully somebody will slap him. I, I'd pay money to see somebody slap his face. I just really would. He just has a face that needs to be smacked. Oh, come on. No he violence. Does. We don't preach violence here. We don't preach violence. Smack isn't violent. That's violence. That's not violence. That's not violent. No, no, the way you said that, smack, I, I think of like smack the drug in the 80s. <laughs> it's like smack isn't violent. Like, 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 I don't know, but, but net neutrality, net neutrality just had to, had to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, that, that, that was my five. I thought five. we needed five, five. Um, but yeah, I kind of mixed it up. It was supposed to be five new stories. You thought I, I was going to rant. Five new stories. <laughs> <laughs> Or it's like, I can not make how I'm collected. I was having a good day. It looks like Sam had a bad week. Man's like, ah! <laughs> Flip the table. Okay, uh, hold on. Do you have any, any uselessnesses that you would like to add for your uselessness of the year? Oh, you muted. Uh, sorry, I was still muted there. Uh, I, I didn't really do the assignment, but but <laughs> <laughs> three of the ones that I was thinking of, Sam took. So I would be in in very much in lockstep with him. Uh, the thing I would add is, is, like I said, during our sort of Apple segment there, so many companies I feel got burned this year because of things like disclosure. Like So a little like baby uselessness in addition to Sam's list would be like, like how OnePlus replied to some of the problems they faced this year, including user data being uh, acquired on people's behavior, how they were using their phones, uh, benchmark rigging, things like that. When, when uh, they can't get out ahead of those stories or appeal to their fan base, to their community and explain what it is that these things are doing, then again, it makes your company look like they're doing something shady. And we saw this problem in very localized, uh, in very localized ways address a number of manufacturers this year. Cool. Uh, Warren, anything else you want to add? 
Let's see. Um, I mean, I know Sam covered the whole gambit. Thank you very much for uh, Sam, Sam for being out a lot for us. <laughs> Sam covered a large gambit of uselessness that's been going on. Oh, man. Um, shoot, there's, there's, there's not much else to cover, I think. I'm, I'm trying to think here. And then neutrality has been kind of beaten to death, I think, in terms of like how useless that's uh, that's been. Um I think we've kind of run into Uber and ride sharing services being useless is and pounding them into the ground as much as we, we as we possibly can with them as well too. Um YouTube in general has been pounded into the ground too and YouTube deserving leave considering how poor they've been managing the platform recently um and specifically with with such great and high popular creators and not really and not really knowing how to manage it properly which hopefully maybe they'll learn their lessons from i there, I, i'm trying to think of who else there, there's there's so many there's a lot of uselessness that goes on throughout the year but man the, those are the kind of the big ones out there i think i think youtube tops the cake um and and, and besides that that besides well i don't I don't want to say just Facebook, but I want to say the general media and, and, and how it handles fake news is probably one of the biggest uselessness that's been going around and basically saying, we don't know how this fake news got out here. We don't know how things get tracked. You have algorithms and being able to analytically uh, use data points, like Sam said, to figure out where things are coming from. Stop hiring the intern and look at the analytics. Stop hiring the... The, the 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 person that majored in like I don't know, geez, like basket weaving or something, and say, well, you have a degree, you can go in here and do data analytics and figure this out. No, get people that know what they're doing in terms of analytical data, reading what those things are, understanding what those things are, and reporting back to you when you have problems. Because with all these algorithms that collect all this analytical data, the amount of uselessness that we see from a lot of these companies does not make a lot of sense. They tout so much about this stuff being so great and automation and algorithms and bringing in the data and data-driven metrics and all those other stupid-ass buzzwords that they love to come out with. But yet, we still have uselessness, like you said. With uh, How many Uber fails were there this year? I don't know. Sam's been keeping count. I think he's got a little X in the board. <laughs> I think it's three or four. Three, 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 or, three, or, four. Four. three or four useless, although, I won't, although I'll, I'll, I'll full disclosure, I use Uber and Lyft both at the same time because I don't give a damn. I want the two to compete against each other until the end of time because I'm not going to allow one of them to dominate over the other just because we need to make sure that that doesn't turn into a monopoly from one side at all whatsoever. Um, the uh, YouTube, how many L's did YouTube take this year? Did he take more than Microsoft? Yeah. That, 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 that's quite an accomplishment. Like, you actually I mean, have Microsoft's to work. Big to L was just they didn't release any compelling products, but as well, no, they, oh, no, I, no, they got some big L's. So, okay, let's go into Microsoft. We haven't talked about them and their L's. Killing Windows <laughs> Phone and pretending that, it, pretending that they didn't exist. Um, Windows 10S and its existence, period. Uh, the, the making, the, making a Surface laptop an actual laptop. I don't know how the hell that works with the Surface line. The whole point of that whole thing was it's supposed to be the tablet conversion. I, I say I don't consider it an L because it, that thing is damn good, though. It, it's a laptop. It's not a Surface. Go make, a, go, go make something else. Call it something else else it's not it, microsoft laptop would have been fine but the the, the throw it into the you, surface you gotta line, sell it you gotta spit, put it in the surface line yeah so. I, I, and, it, and it's been <laughs> all the rest of the tablets and the and the functionality that they were trying to create with those you think we're gonna get a surface phone i heard rumors that there's gonna be a surface phone the, who we cares surface phone. who can <laughs> nobody cares about anything microsoft mobile related at all whatsoever. Another uselessness that microsoft loves to do is popping up any other time screw let's, let's start this off Fuck you, Microsoft. Every time you try to pop up, when I open up Chrome or any other browser, why don't you use Microsoft Edge? No, I don't want to use Microsoft Edge. And every time you make an update, stop trying to, stop trying to change the default to Edge because you do do that and then make it more difficult for everyone to try and make it by default. Stop that one. Oh, I think you were done there. You paused for a second. No, 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 no. I'm done with that one yet. That one. <laughs> no. Secondly, don't pop up to me and tell me, hey, you know, connect your phone to, you know, your Windows 10. You ain't got no damn phone. 
How are you going to be able to do that? You, you, <laughs> you want me to your Android phone. You just have to with, with what? Cortana. Using their apps, using their apps, their services, and using their stupid start skin on it. You want to, so, so how is that technically? That's not using your phone with Windows. That's using their software that somewhat syncs with their software to create to happen when there's a whole bunch of other apps that are free that do better than whatever they want to do. Oh, popping up a text message onto, onto a Windows PC is not hard. And it's plenty of free and paid and very cheaply paid services that will do that but it's for also you. Free and it's a free app, so you yeah, and it's plenty of free, yeah, and it's plenty of free apps to do it. That was just a gripe, man. You don't want to use something. No, 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 no. But it, <laughs> but but the thing is, it, it's not just a gripe. It's like, why would you advertise that when you don't have your own phone and your own ecosystem that would entice me to actually want to use that type of synergy? That's why that's a fail. Don't pop it up at me and then pretend and then, and then pretend you didn't kill Windows Phone. I mean, just 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 putting that out there. Um, what are the, but Microsoft's had so many other fails beyond beyond what that has been, but their stock keeps going up because they're pushing cloud shit, and that's mostly because of Azure. It isn't anything else that they're doing. Azure's doing well, and they somewhat saved Xbox from utter doom <laughs> with the Xbox One X selling probably far better than I think anyone anticipated to actually do. Well, I mean, it's going to do much better now that you can get Cody on it. Woo-hoo! For all of the two weeks anyone will care about that, and all the streams are going to cut out after it. <laughs> Every stream is dying on that thing, though. Like, f- quickly and rapidly dying. <laughs> I don't know because I don't use Cody, so I have no I idea. Haven't touched, I haven't touched Cody in years. And, yeah, but I stuck that, to Plex, man. Uh, just, just Plex and... But yeah, but I do know people who use Cody and says it still works perfectly for them. So I'm just passing on the message. Uh-huh. As no, as Cody, Cody's been getting updated. And, and, yeah, and, I mean, that's, that's it, nice. It should be workable with people. Yeah, yeah, use the Cody and all that stuff and look at your shit HD. Or if anything is actually in HD on that thing yeah, whatsoever. Stuff in HD. Uh, I've seen it recently and some of the content uh-huh. comes through. It's crappy. Uh, I'm just, I am just it is you. very crappy looking. Let me, let me tell you something. Bootleg better, okay? Bootleg better. If you're wow, bootleg, whoa, 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 whoa. This show better. is not about illegalities. <laughs> We're talking about Cody. You're just going to show up. <laughs> you might as well be real about it. It's no, like, no, no. you're going to no, bootleg, no. bootleg. I was better. talking about, look, my, it was, it's an app that's available on the Xbox, basically allowed by Microsoft. That was it. I, I only oh. share my home video. Which doesn't make sense. Which even makes less sense. Because isn't that what the Xbox is? Isn't that what the software is? You have you're better off just using the Plex plugin. Literally, use the Plex app, get yourself a Plex server, and you're set. You're really set. That costs you more money. This is no, just no, well, not realistically, because you can run Plex off your PC and it can just connect through. Yeah, I'm just saying. Hey, just I'm just putting it out there. I was just sharing information. That's all. Microsoft put it out. You, can you go said the word it. Cody. That's already, <laughs> already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I already don't like it. When my mother is asking, hey, this is Cody thing. If you can set up fire, I said, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> I was like, we're not doing that. <laughs> that's amazing, right? But that, that's so. So, so that's the, like I was putting together my list of uh, of uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, top stories, and I think wire cutting technology. Uh, yeah. Definitely a big thing this year. Yeah. Like 2017 yeah. has taken the move that we've had between like 2012 and 2015, and all of a sudden just exploded in 2017. It's, it's the services really are finally there. Like the, I think a sure. big thing was I think a big thing was Direct Now showing up. Direct Now, yeah, right. But I don't even think the fact. I don't even think that the fact that we had any technological shift. I think is the fact that in like regular users are now aware. They're now aware that they don't have to pay for a huge well, cable bill. I think yes, no, that, no, no, that's no, 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 but that's that because, that's because true, if you go back to Amazon Warren and the said, Fire Stick. Yeah, but if you go back to what Warren said is, as much as DirecTV now only has, I mean, they have a million subscribers, but the fact that AT&T literally said, we're changing DirecTV, which we bought, which is a satellite dish, and we are making it this. And it's not. You it's know, not even. I don't even think it's come out of a satellite anymore. I think it's. Come, yeah, I think it's, it's not. It's, 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 it's just. just I think it's the literally. They're just branding Uverse. Yeah. No. It, it, yeah. it is. But I know. But that's the thing. It's like. But that's the mindset that they change. And people are like. Oh, and you're like. Oh, you can have your TV anywhere. Yeah. When a big company. Remember, Comcast was supposed to do this. And technically, uh, uh, you know, a long time ago, we yeah, all know that. that. But I'm just that, saying that, that's a whole long but, discussion but, that will take forever. But the fact that AT&T did that forced everybody immediately. YouTube, uh, Hulu changed their own. Like everybody was like, "Oh shit, we need to now drop 
our services or else we will be out there. But Direct TV did it very well. They advertised it well. They pushed it well. They bundled a stick with it. They made it so that we, we, you, you bought from them that service. You had everything you needed to get the service set up. Unlike Sling TV, which should have did this earlier and should have had that, should have should have been the ones to push it. But I think one not really put putting not really pushing out any hardware with it and having two a very terrible interface in my opinion didn't really help. And having a extremely limited number of channels can that launch compared to um, what AT and T pushed out. Oh yeah, but also AT and T. I mean, AT and T did the best thing possible, even though they don't own Warner Brothers yet, right? Yeah. As soon as they got, as soon as they started merger talks, they said we were throwing HBO in there. Now it's HBO for lifetime if you actually sign up. I mean, think about that. They they were like, we will just give you the I, best I, I, streaming channel content I, I, for you I, I, for the rest of your life. I have my mother set up this year with two Fire Sticks and the um, uh, Direct Now account that I, I don't really use because I have a Comcast while I'm uh, while I'm here in uh, Boston, and I set her up with that, and she loves it. She sees no difference between that and regular TV, and just uses it, and and then she switches between that, the Netflix, and whatever's on Amazon Prime, and works perfectly well. Oh. That's... I, I, I will say though, I wanted to put this in before we go into text we like and stuff like that. Set now. Why? My TV, you know. my biggest disappointment this year um, is I, it's not it's not one thing. I felt like there was a lack of true innovation across the board from every company in any things that would wow me. There was a lot of refinements, there were a lot of cool stuff, but I didn't feel like I got any piece of tech this year that I went hot damn. Yeah. Like, and I I agree this with that because I kind I of wanted to get. I felt like I felt like yeah, there were some nice refinements here and there, but but, but, but don't you think? Yeah, well, no, but... no, no. Well, well, there's. I'm just saying me. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I would okay. say well, oh uh, well, this is tough to say, but I would say I would say I would say what about Threadripper and Ryzen? I know it's a, just a processor, mm -hmm. but and, okay, and I don't. That I don't, was I'm, absolutely going to be my one plug for a company this year. Was yeah, I mean, I was I, I'm so happy, so happy to have a competitive AMD again. Yeah, I, I, I was going to put them there, but the, my my problem with that thanks was to, thanks to E starting it off. What you? It's all your fault that I had to build this machine. Dude, I told you. Let's, let's talk about how this started. Let's talk about the story of this started. The rising I here. PCs. I no, told no, you no, awesome no, 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 no. Let's start off how this started. Why is he arguing when he has that powerful machine? Because you, be, you should be thanking me. I, I already had a good machine. I had an awesome, you know, my machine. It was a good machine. It's old, but it, it's still rocking. The next thing you know, I get a text from this fool, and he's like, hey, man, Fed Ripper's on sale. Top of line, like 100 bucks. <laughs> and I was like, Damn it! Do you know what you just started by doing this? Go by. I was like, yeah, here we go. I'm not gonna just sit on this thing, and he knew it too. <laughs> I was trying to help a brother out, man. I mean, you know, you know, he said he was gonna build next year. I figured he might as well just bump the schedule up a little faster. Yeah, a lot faster than I wanted to go. <laughs> no, but you know, he moved faster than I did because I really thought he was gonna buy the processor, wait a little bit. But finally, Warren's like, "Yeah, what case should I get?" And I'm getting this this processor. And man, check out this motherboard. Then he's like, "I want to get RAM." Now I got. I was like, "With lights?" He's like, "God damn it, gotta get lights for my RAM. I can't have a build without lights." Um, <laughs> RGB, RGB. The, the one thing I hate about this X399 system, it pisses me off. Is all of them have all of them are all RGB, and you just yeah. cannot cannot have a system that you spend that money on and not pay for the RGB RAM for it. You yeah, just, because there will be a dark spot on your motherboard there with no lights, and it's just, it's not cool. I mean, it's 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 cool. ISA software sucks for controlling because it basically doesn't control it. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> it basically doesn't. But it's, it's, it's like my whole case is RGB. Jeff, there's going to be a video coming up on all, on all of it, my Threadripper experiences. And okay, stuff so, like so that. I guess we can all say that AMD fits that company that gets a top tech bump for this year. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you looked at what they've done, um, they've, they've allowed higher end systems and they've allowed higher end processes to be one, one more reachable than what Intel was doing back then. And they've also sort of segmented processors a bit in, in the way that they've said that if you want gaming and stature computing, you want to go with our Ryzen 3, 5, or 7 systems versus you can come to Threadripper. It, it does 
gaming is there, but they're like, this is our content creation platform, and this is what yeah. we, we, when you when you buy this, this we're we're, we're talking for, to the YouTubers and the and the uh, music makers and you know uh, graphics VR and graphics and, center stuff yeah. like that. We have a way for you to build a machine powerful enough to do that because usually you have to buy those machines typically, or because it would it would be cheaper to buy than you to try to build that type of powerful machine for yourself. But now you can actually get that. With with uh, with um, AMD Ryzen, and I, I think that's a real good thing that they put out that that, that they put out there that that I think they're going to change the market quite a bit quite a bit in that space. I would like to see them step up the graphics cards a little bit, although I, I I honestly think we have plateaued to the point of graphics cards, so it's like nothing's going to matter until they until they all do some type of AI that's going to be needed for some type of game. In in the graphics cards before we see another probably huge jump in graphics technology, which probably won't be for another two or three years in that case. So I would say probably too. I think this year at CES we'll be seeing companies trying to push like a super fast refresh rate 4K displays. And yeah, absolutely. then we'll see we'll see a need for stepping up in terms of graphics. And so that TikTok will probably start executing by the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Yeah, that's, that's that's hopefully something we'll see with the improvements of 4K. I had to give up on 4K monitors for a while because I wanted something newer, but you can't get anything decently priced at a high refresh rate, and it just does not scale very well. It was getting to the point my eyes are bothering me looking at 4K monitors. I was like, I, you know what? I give up the ghost on this. And, and, and Because of E, I bought another damn monitor to go along with this whole bill. What the hell is wrong with this dude? Blaming me for you get no. spending money. I almost got almost got an RGB monitor too. I almost got an <laughs> RGB monitor too. The, the, luckily, the RGB version of the monitor I got was a lower resolution, and I wanted I wanted at least thirty four forty. That was like twenty five sixty. But the the one I do have, it does have a light at the bottom of the damn thing though that that, that glows Ace's logo. I can't change color on it, so I'm kind of pissed. But <laughs> you can just just add like a Philips Hue strip, man. I already have on the back of my desk. You've seen my videos. There, there you go, <laughs> man. You, you, you're done. You're done completely. I will say this with uh, AMD's um, CPU offering. Uh, one of the best benefits I got from it, um, I have the 49-inch monitor here, and the system I was running before, and basically these are identical systems except the one change is the processor. Yeah, but right was, my initial system was an Intel 7700K with a uh, Maxwell Titan X. 32 gigs of RAM, um, you know, just same layout. And it, you know, th this monitor will run with any graphics card that can do a, a what do you call it again? Uh, three, three monitor output. Oh, three monitor output. Oh. So I plugged it in. Um, everything looked great until I tried to render a video. Now, normally on my system, when a regular monitor, a six minute video will render in about seven and a half, eight minutes. With the Intel system, a six minute video took 45 minutes. <laughs> so I was like, what the, what did you code? What the I, hell I was, happened? I, initially I was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I mean, it's the GPU. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm wondering. So I go, you know what? I tried everything. I did updates. I said, let me switch to my Ryzen 7 1700, uh, 1700, 11 1700X. Uh, That's what, quad or hexacore? Um, no, it's octacore, I think. I can't remember, but it, it's, sim it's similar to the 7777. Yeah, it's, it's octa-core, eight-core, yeah. 16 threads. I uh, I plugged it in. I connected it again, same monitor. Again, the, the change was just the processor. I put the same six-minute video, and it took nine minutes to render. And I said, Intel, this is the last time I'm using you because that's the only thing that I change. With, yeah. I mean, yeah, we oh. granted they had different boards, but it's still the same. Um, setup structure and price range if you will. Well the so, fact that because we all use most of us in here use uh for editing we use Adobe Premiere Pro. That's usually kind of de facto everyone uses when you're doing high end like uh intermediate level or high level video editing. Some people still use Sony Vegas. But um, <laughs> 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 um and thank you they got bought out by Magix. So you don't even uh, have the fun Sony uh, name anymore. Magix of all of all what? I, 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 that I, that's I gotta say that's you're awkward. working at ABC, now that they finally improved their compatibility with NVIDIA GPUs, uh, mm -hmm. Vegas 
Vegas Pro 15 is still the most stable platform I've had for not having to transcode HEVC. It renders natively in the timeline, and it's that is one of the that's one of the things I was gonna just about to to bring up. Also, I'll bring that up probably in my kind of sort of review of this new PC I've built. Um, for for Ryzen to probably not be optimized for Adobe by Adobe, it's worked far better for me from a performance perspective than it has on the Intel platforms, from what I've noticed. Um, specifically, rendering out, like I, I did a five minute video test. I was talking at the end, I did a five minute video test on uh, exporting out in uh, 14, in uh, H.264, uh, 4K, whatever, you know, export out with all the coloring and all that stuff done with it. It was a five minute video and it exported out one to one in five minutes. That, I have not seen that happen since 1080p. And that's amazing that it can pull that off because that that that's a huge huge upside to have, especially 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 if you're editing 4K video. Now the disappointing thing is that, it, and I blame this on Adobe, it still doesn't improve the way H.264 works inside of it. It's still, it's not it's herky jerky, but it's just it's just not smooth when you scroll across the uh, the timeline so uh for those that don't do video editing the reason you would want that like it's edible if you don't want to convert the file you can still edit with it but the problem kind of becomes is when you want to get a specific point on a video it becomes a lot harder because the thing just kind of skips and jump cuts quite heavy kind of all cross around sort of like i don't know what he's doing right now and it's just weird. <laughs> that's that's a sign to say, let's not get into details and let's jump to the next tech topic that we like for 2017. Thank you very much, Warren. We will continue that explanation later. Just been interrupting me the entire damn time. <laughs> so, Sam, I think what Warren is, this is bringing up some excellent points, and exactly. I'm glad he's contributing to the conversation. No, no, he is. It is. We just need to kind of move forward. That's what I'm just saying. I apologize. You know, we'll create a separate show at night, and we can talk about you know Adobe Premiere and processes and stuff like that. Now I'm just like, uh, <laughs> Juan, do you have any? Uh, so, what, what would you like to throw in as your uh, tech success, or you know? things you like this year. Yeah, um, AMD was my number one, but this was also, I think, a good year. If, if we're getting back to mobile too, I AMD, I think part of their success, and this is kind of tracking back to a point Warren made, it, this was a good year for specialist gear. Threadripper is not a great gaming CPU. That, that price performance ratio just doesn't pan out if you wanted to build a killer rig for gaming. But for what we just went through in the conversation was, uh, talking about video uh, editing and rendering, um, I, I think we saw some really great pocket successes for specialist gear in a number of other communities too. BlackBerry had the best year they've had in probably a decade on the back of their TCL partnership releasing the Key One. We found the resurgence of Samsung's Note, you know, weathering a battery explosion problem last year to being one of their top sellers this year. Uh, LG continuing to focus on a specific demographic with the V30, even though their marketing and software sucks. Um, this this was a good year for focusing, for, for paying attention to a specific demographic, a specific market, and executing a product for them, as opposed to years past where I feel everyone sort of pretended that they could be all-rounders for everybody. Um, all-rounders are boring. All-rounders don't really get the job done. Jack of all trades doesn't impress me what impresses me is a company actually trying to satisfy the needs of a particular community okay uh sam uh would you like to throw in uh something else other than AMD and spe specified phones um i i i would say um smart speakers slash assistants it, it's amazing how that market has matured over the last few months and that is something we we, we can point to actual products and say you know because of smart speakers this person released this or this other company <clears throat> even microsoft decided to pair with Harman Kardon to do the invoke so even they realize you need hardware with your own um, smart assistants on it's out there for people to use because everyone's talking about it. Even my little nephew spent part of his allowance to get a uh, a Google Home Mini. I'm like wow, everyone knows about these things. So it's it's I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, um, 
technology stories of the year or technology moves of the year that these this particular market is maturing very fast. And also the fact that Google now has um, two requests at once. You can make two requests at the same time. And that's pretty cool. That, that's actually uh, pretty nice. I'm glad you, you brought that up. I'm surprised you didn't mention any of the specific names like Alexa, um, because <laughs> you know how like they were all. Okay. This oh, reason no. I said this reason I said that quietly because <laughs> <laughs> they are listening in the background. But I, and I think you're definitely right on that too. Um, I, I, you know, it's it's helped spearhead. I think the AI talk for me is one of the things that I love and hate it um, because I, I personally don't call it or consider it AI, but. I, I like where it's going in the, in the fact that, yes, you know, now that um, a lot of that processing is happening and, you know, you're trying to get um, your algorithms to be smarter, you know, and we saw it at least clearly for me with the Pixel camera, the fact that it's, I consider the best smartphone camera this year, that you were able to churn out pictures where Google showed us that software can triumph in the year where everybody said it's two lenses, baby. You know, I mean, it was you know from your budget manufacturers to your uh, you know big uh, smartphone manufacturers. You know that leap where they announced the Pixel, and I remember I remember myself at the press conference. I was like, "What is wrong with you people? One camera, Puh, please, rubbish." And then I took a picture. And I was like, "Never mind, I just." didn't believe you guys. Um, and, you know, and that's because, you know, of course, their AI algorithm they've been using. So I, I, I want to see what happens with that in 2018. And as we move forward, what other things can you apply? How does that work with different processor types and, you know, vector units, especially when it's on the mobile platform, when it's even on, because, you know, to me is, is I want to see and, you know, this is going back to Microsoft and, it, you know, to me is, you know, how can they use AI to make Windows better? Like, how can you do that where... Katana, um, I ask you a question every five seconds. <laughs> no, well, we're not talking about, but like, for instance, you know, we talked about, you know, you mentioned AI graphics cards, right? Windows has a lot of specified functions and Microsoft knows how I mean, you could collect data from this. Like, I want to see how they can say, okay, can we make things a little bit more specialized in the PC so that we can have better graphics performance, we can have better video, we can have just better things all around and we can use the algorithm from that to make it a better process and with other apply, uh, you know pieces of technology out there so for me that's one thing that i think this year uh the emergence of ai um um was a big benefit all right so that's a that's like four things anybody have like one more you know want to add if you guys don't mind me jumping in again, um, I would say Sam has his list. Man. Like, <laughs> sounds like I did my homework. No, no, no. It just, it just, I, I think this year, I think you were right. This year, we didn't see any major hardware innovation, but we did see a lot of markets maturing. Like Tesla, to me, is just blow. It's like this is the future, right? Because they have pushed this whole self-driving cars and now they're pushing self-driving trucks. Now we have Uber, we have VW, we have a bunch of other companies that are looking to do something that if you told me five years ago that may, within 10 years, we might see actual self-driving cars on the road that people own, I would have said you were like smoking something. But this is actually going to happen probably before 2020. And this is really amazing. I think that market is a very mature and a very um, and it's being led by a very innovative company, um, Tesla. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually very impressed at it. I actually saw an ad for a Ford F-150 with assisted parking. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, okay. I guess we're all there now. It's it's it's, it's impressive. It's impressive how how well self-driving cars and trucks uh, how far they've come this year. Cool. So, oh, I mean, on all these things tying together, I think what we're looking at, because, uh, you know, we, we've been saying we're rapidly approaching that post smartphone world. Um, it seems like the next phase of consumer electronics is really going to come down to watching companies try and figure out more organic interactions for data services and things like, um, you know, uh, lifestyle conveniences. 
I don't think that the the future is having a smart fridge with a camera inside so you can see inside your fridge when you're at work. But that kind of technology and that kind of consumer experience is going to keep feeding into the overall um, blueprint of the human condition. Um, it, it, it's it's both a positive and a negative because, you know, we need to track all of that information, assign it to you and your account, and then they can come up with better algorithms to actually fulfill what it is excuse me, that you're trying to do. But that also means that companies like, you know, Google, Amazon, Samsung, um, all have this humongous bucket of data on you and your behavior. But the next phase of this has a ton of potential. And that's what's kind of exciting is it gives, giving us a little hope for the future of consumer electronics, the future of tech and humanity. I, I look at moves like augmented reality, that could be a really positive step towards improving um our interactions with technology i'm not impressed in 2017 closing this year out that so many people still think that this is sort of the right way to consume data and interact with the world around them and i really feel we could have done better by now but no one wants to take risks well now we're finally starting to see some of this investment in data acquisition and in new technology starting to pay off the little hints the pixels computational camera processing um, self-driving features on cars, cameras and smart speakers everywhere, smarter voice interactions so you don't have to type out everything. These things are going to be a huge benefit, not just for those of us who are already tech fans, but also for people who don't get to participate in the same way because of other issues. So once we sort of elevate the experience for everybody, um, minus the fact that net neutrality is going to screw us, um, <laughs> Once we elevate the, that experience for everybody, I think we'll have better participation on all fronts. Okay. Um, Lauren, do you have anything or can we move to 2018, what we want to see um, in move tech? On. Move on? Okay. Um, I mean, for me, I, I guess I'll start. Um, I, I want to see, see AI improve, um, you know, uh, I think also I've been I've been spoiled because uh, I've been reading too many sci-fi novels, but I have <laughs> AI in it, and I just don't consider this. I really it it's very hard for my brain to reconcile. So I really want a lot of that vector processing, a lot of that computational analysis to apply to other things and not be limited um, as we move forward. You know, and yes, it's going to start with a smartphone. And it would extend with smart speakers and things like that. But I really want to see companies find innovative ways of applying that AI computation into everyday products. So even talking about that smart fridge, right? And having the camera inside and things like that, where if you know my fridge is now actively looking at what I have inside and then actively, you know, I don't have to input and say, okay, I put eggs and then I put a week. My fridge is already doing that for me and telling me like, oh, hey, look, dude, um, your eggs are like a month old. So you got to throw them away and buy new eggs that I would like to see, even though, you know, some people might say it's trivial, but it's just it helps. You know, it works for different types of people and also just shows you how far it's moving forward. So I personally would like to see it move into more regular products. Uh, and seeing how that actually helps in day-to-day -day activities, you know, away from these sexy uh, devices like smartphones or self-driving cars or even AR. I wanted to see it in, in you know, vacuums, you know, the robo vacuums. I, why don't we shouldn't they have AR computational analysis there so that it's not bumping into stuff like half the time, you know, because those things just use infrared and um, uh, infrared cameras to basically map out. So. Those are the things I would, at least I would like to see. Pretty cool. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I like those <laughs> ideas. I like those <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Well, but I mean, is, isn't, isn't, I mean, one of the reasons why we continue to do these weekly, weekly broadcasts, the reason why we continue to review products, even though YouTube is screwing with us on a daily basis. I mean, at, at, at our core, I think we're all tech optimists. I think the human condition has improved through the use of these products more than it's uh, degraded. But that still means that we're always going to be on the conversation as to how these things can get better and uh, where we want to see these improvements so that this condition gets better. Um, th that, that to me sort of plays in hand. What I want to see is, is uh, it, it, 
improvement in the social interactions and data and services that really take advantage of this stuff. I'm, I'm kind of tired of everyone trying to impress consumers through novelty. It's shinier, it's prettier, it's got a glass back, it's got a slightly better camera, it's got a slightly faster processor. We're in an era of really iterative hardware. And so now it's time to start really taking advantage, really taxing that hardware to see what the next generation of services are gonna be, are, are going to provide. The novelty of VR wears off really quickly if you don't have new content to really encourage people to get on board the VR train. AR is super nifty for about a minute and then you exhaust the uh, creative uh, possibilities of the Ikea app on your phone. And so it's time for this next year. And what I really hope to see is that this stuff really take off because once it does, then I think we'll be able to affect actual change in the market and really make the, these things better. The notion of a self-driving car with an AR overlay on your windshield and a smart heads up display that interacts with content in a meaningful fashion, keeping it up at eye level. You don't have this weird evolutionary thing of people walking around you know, choking themselves off with their fat necks because they have to look down at their phone. Like we could do that. Better. That's because of in and out burning, man. They we could do so much better. Is. I don't know. I think Five Guys is contributing to that problem. I think the habit is contributing to that problem. Dude, the but habit. Ultimately, the like habit? as as you walk around and you see like I'm, I've got this like weak wrist because I can barely hold my phone up and I have to look down my screen. Like you, you this this is a terrible place to take humanity and we can do better and i think 2018 will hopefully be a year we take another step in doing better okay um uh warren anything uh sam mm, 2018 <sighs> what to look forward to i i mean i'm, I'm thinking in next year it, I, I don't see a lot of big things changing next year. I see more refinement, more development, more markets maturing. I don't see one big new thing coming out there. The things I would like to see um, in terms of technology, from a technology, um, but not from technology, from a from space of things that happened last year, I'd love to see uh, things like YouTube and, and other social services that we're using sort of improve the way it works stop, you know, boning us around and really try to make the platform work in its proper way. I, I, I think realistically that where the technology change is going to be is going to be mostly in how cryptocurrency and and that technology is going to be what's going to be the colleague of the big talk next year over some of the stuff we, we're seeing in the consumer electronics space. Um, I think the consumer electronics space right now, I don't want to say it's plateaued. It's just in, it, it's just in, it, it, in, it's in its period of refinement, so it needs to develop, mature, refine, refine, refine. Then we'll see maybe a big change or a big leap or a big jump at some point um, at, 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 when it's the right time. But I think we're a couple of years of one or two years, maybe a maximum three years of refinement before we get to the next sort of big jump and leap in technology. Uh, but I think the big thing next year to be excited about will be uh, where, how, cryptocurrency and blockchain will affect us in the way we do things next year. And that's going to have effects on all aspects of services from online to even things that are, you know, physical services to, uh, the, we, to, to everything, every, pretty much everything that we do is going to be kind of affected by that. I'm really interested to see where that goes. And I think that's the exciting, that's the, I think that's the point that a lot of stuff's going to be exciting in terms of uh, technology next year. That, that I'm looking the most forward to. Um, I'm, I'm sort of on the tip of one as like, there's only so many ways you can refine a glowing rectangle before it's kind of like, yep, it's the same glowing rectangle. This year, the rectangle's a little skinnier and a little more glowy. Uh, I, I, I mean, the things that I can think of that they could do big, I mean, I think cameras will be, another big, will be the big, big feature that everyone focuses on next year again um and, and and really refining and pushing that technology and trying to catch up with google with a lot of just ai and machine learning stuff like that um to to create better product to create better photos but beyond that it's it's really just battery battery improvements uh software improvements uh, little sleeker designed hardware making things look making things look a little sexier and a little nicer uh than the previous year 
uh, TVs are, I, I think, well, we'll see with TVs. TVs are always like five years ahead of what anybody ever held is going to buy. That's just kind of, <laughs> that's just kind of how it is. They come up with some cool new tech and it's like, when it's not $5,000 anymore than everybody else, so then you'll, then you'll start to see it in on more of a regular, regular basis. And that's kind of how TV sort of work. Um, I'm, I'm really thinking of maybe we'll see some more stuff in the wireless space with AD wireless becoming a thing and seeing more routers sort of support that. But um, just kind of rambling on here. I don't know if you guys, Sam, Randy, has anything else going yeah, on. I, I mean, think I think it's, I think it's really the cryptocurrency thing is really to me where in blockchain is where I think the exciting tech stuff is happening. I mean, I agree with you on blockchain itself. I think cryptocurrency, uh, the cryptocurrencies themselves, I mean, it remind me of something I heard from, uh, I can't remember the CEO of what uh, bank, and he said, he he put it out himself and said, that, yeah, blockchain definitely is like, cryptocurrencies, you know, will always face the problems of central banks. And he considers um, blockchain changing the way um, he liked to call it, he called it, He's like every currency has a cryptocurrency. No, no, a virtual currency. Sorry, there's a virtual dollar because we move money left and right from banks, all that kind of stuff. So, his own thing was, and I agree to a large degree that I think crypto, uh, blockchain, and how that tech moves to other facets. You know, whether it's insurance, you know, it's it's basically bookkeeping at its best level, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and how it's that basically, moves. Basically, it's, it's but the whole the, idea with the blockchain, with the, blockchain the, the, a, the coins. Oh, sorry, you're probably going to say the coins are what runs the block. No, no, the, the coins don't run the blockchain. Um, ba basically, what, what it is, is the, the, um, for a Bitcoin, you're mining. Now, this is very high level. Sorry if I, if I, yeah. if I messed this up. It's very high level. Right? You're, you're mining um, or you, you, you're basically mining data. You're crunching data. And the result of this crunching data is what we're, what we're placing the value on. When the real value is really for the distributed ledger, right? So basically, what, what the whole idea of the blockchain is that if I have a transaction, if I pay, if I buy a stock, or if I buy, let's say I buy a product from you, e, um, what happens is if that product changes hand, right? If I then give that product to, um, to Warren, right? It's not only just, we just don't recognize a transaction between myself and Warren. The transaction is, oh, transaction one, two, three between Sam and Warren. Transaction A, B, one, two, three between Sam and um, E. It recognizes and it follows that transaction through the whole process. So anytime and that transaction is modified, it doesn't negate everything that comes before, which is a problem it's, it's, that a lot of even, have right It's now. not even technically it's modified. Right. It's not technically modified. A new transaction is written Every, every yeah. when you change, it's written every single time. It, it doesn't. It doesn't it can't override. Be yeah, it, it can't doesn't be override the prior. Um, yeah. the, 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 the prior transaction. So it's a very good way. If you think about it in in a whole industry where you have multiple banks with multiple different ledgers, all of a sudden everyone is on the same distributed ledger. The transaction done, done by a CD bank is the same transaction that can be recognized by a Barclays, can be recognized by some podunk bank somewhere in the middle of nowhere. It makes everything easier. It makes tracking these transactions a lot easier. So yeah, no, the distributed ledger, I think, is, is, is the real thing that's going to come out of this whole um, cryptocurrency uh, um, the, explosion. The, the, the thing that's key is that you can do this at such a cheaper and faster rate than they could oh, yeah. beforehand. And that's where things like, this is why uh, something like uh, you're hearing a lot about Ripple and, and the way that's why that's exploded so much in recent. I think it's second in market cap now just under Bitcoin and you're hearing about that because that's what it's kind of it's, its focus is on is doing these type of secure business transactions and financial transactions at a very fast rate across multiple banks. So the, 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 that's where the coin can come in because that coin, that means that type of currency on the ledger is accepted not only by that bank, but then this other bank here, you don't have the, you don't have to have to worry about, uh, what am I thinking of currency? Exchanging oh, yeah, like yeah, currency yeah, conversions yeah. and stuff like exactly. that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to say. That that that, that you don't have to, to worry about because they're both using the same um, coin value to each other to um to communicate to communicate that transaction. So it's, it's so hard to explain. Jason Jason Gill put it very like he, he, he did a great job, Jason. What you saw here said, in other for you to settle a transaction, right? Normally you book a trade. 
um, on a T plus one basis, you verify that trade just in, in case anything changes. And then the trade would normally settle on T2 or T plus one or T2, right? Yeah. Now with something like Ripple, four seconds. Yeah. Instant. <laughs> like, instant. like four Crazy. seconds. <laughs> and and, and it's, this isn't the only ones doing that. There's another one that I've, I've looked at called Zen Protocol that essentially is trying to do the same sort of thing for financial services. So imagine if um, um, a lot of the way the way trading works, which I think the middleman within trading between funds and the brokers is like the biggest scam I've ever seen in my life. I don't know how they're allowed to make money. It's just a big, it's, it's mostly a big ripoff. But um for example, like uh, I, I typically a hedge fund, um, they make trades throughout the day, but they have to have those trades verified. So they go through order management system. They say, we want to trade Apple, whatever stock they want to trade. Then at the end of the day, it connects over to the broker. But there's a certain middleman that's in the middle that guarantees that trade connection between the hedge fund and the uh, broker to make sure that that trade does go through and they accept the trade. The funny thing is that middle person, every time that fires up, they get paid by mm -hmm. by the hedge fund to fire up and, and ensure that transaction. Then on the other end, the brokers have to buy in to specific, uh, um, bro specific sort of um, connector. I'll just call them connectors, not their name, but they have to buy in a specific one so that they're able to get these trades because they want the trade because they want to get the fee for the trades, obviously, when trading it around. So it turns into this thing where there's one company that has a monopoly over this whole thing of guaranteeing trades between funds and brokers. I'm, I'm generalizing this here that they're making millions of dollars on and ripping basically both sides off, essentially for something that sh shouldn't really need, shouldn't they shouldn't really have to be in the middle of that. Centralized something, clearing. Something like, yeah, basically centralized clearing houses. Clearing yeah, houses. Basically. Clearing houses. Uh, now, no, but, but, now, something but, like but, before we get it. <laughs> does that in four seconds. Through smart contracts, yep. with no need of that company. And it, it's definitely going to change the way banks um, do business. It's definitely, it's definitely already affecting the way even hedge funds do business. Um, so uh, no, that, that you, you, you're definitely right. The cryptocurrency is going to be a big deal. But for me, I think um, what I'm looking forward to in 2018 is uh, I remember reading this story, and I found it finally here. I remember reading this story earlier this month of. Um, um, a macaca um, monkey that had part of its spine severed. And, um, so its right leg was no longer working. And um, scientists installed a device at the base of its brain to stimulate um, the nerves so that now it can basically think again and have its right leg moving, right? And then you think about that and then you think about what DARPA has been doing with prosthetics. I think we're at a point right now where people who have been paralyzed, people who have lost limbs, they can start hoping that something maybe within the next decade or two, they might be able to walk again. They might be able to like hug people again. They might be able to pick up that sandwich again. They might be able to do something that restores at least some aspect of their normal lives back to them. That's freaking amazing. Just imagine walking outside and, you know, you, 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 someone who was confined to a wheelchair for the past few years, all of a sudden, you know, you're out there running, like jogging in the morning with your best friend who came back from war and couldn't and you couldn't enjoy that run with him anymore. Or someone who hasn't seen for a long time is now being able to see. It's just it's really it's, it's mind blowing. The fact that we're tapping, we're finally tapping into the brain in a way that we haven't tapped into it in so many years. I hope 2018 actually builds more on that. And, you know, we, we get to start seeing actual products, actual prosthetics come out of this, um, this uh, scientific discoveries. Bionautics. Oh, bionautics. Exactly. Bionautics. <laughs> I, really, I really would like to see next year an expansion. Now we're just thinking about it. A real push for more um, of those uh, headphones that can uh, live translate languages. And, and, <laughs> hey, Ronald Collins, I was letting Warren explain it, okay? <laughs> yeah. He's like, you guys just described the clearinghouse. I'm like, yes, that's what yeah, I said. That's the what you said. But it, 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 that's, that's not exactly what it is, but that's probably the easiest layman terms way of saying what it is. <laughs> not exactly that, though. Um, You're definitely right on the uh, translate headsets. I mean, that would be that would uh, that would be very cool to have. Um, I think one of the things, yeah, 
I, just because I've been reading too much sci-fi and watching much sci-fi shows, the fact that language is still a huge barrier in this day and age, you know, um, not even and just from the basis of moving from one country to another. Like, you know, when you, you travel for all these conventions, you go to Barcelona, you go to China and, you know, you want to you, you get there, you do your stuff in the show, but you want to experience the country and you're like, ah, I want to ask a question, you know, like, in, in, yeah, if you have Google, um, uh, Google Translate, that helps a lot. You can, you know, you can do that, but it would be great where we could move to because we are at that stage where we can almost have that, not only similar to Star Trek, but I'm saying when you have a device where immediately once you say English or you mention a language, their person is like, okay, and then they can tap on their phone or whatever, and then it becomes that. No, dude, we're at know. the stage where it can recognize the language. Yeah, exactly. It should be able to it should, recognize, it, be able to recognize it for you, but, but it's that kind of thing. I think one way that could change is, is you could create a system maybe for businesses, especially in countries or areas where there's a lot of um, tourists coming through, right? Um, where a tourist comes to the counter and he speaks, there's a microphone he picks it up and he just starts speaking out in the local language to um, whoever it is, or maybe an earpiece or something like that. So that it gives some of that, you know, connectivity of seeing that I can communicate. Granted, what's going to cause is that eventually we'll never learn any language. We will just speak our own language as is because we're like, yeah, there's a universal translator. We can go anywhere on the planet. Um, but it still does help the fact that you can, you know, you should be able to communicate with somebody else and not feel like uh, you're stuck because we have the tools now to, to basically, um, you know, speak to somebody else in a different language. <laughs> we just want to go to the point. We just, we, like, I, we just want like, to. We, 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 no, we, we just want to be able to go to the bar and understand a cute French girl. That's all. <laughs> I mean, I didn't see that wasn't the part of the list. I was just seeing on an expanded profile. Yes. Yeah. Um, anything else you would like to add, Juan? At the same time, we have things like better translation tools. I think a, a, a really beautiful idea of the future of the net could be something like, uh, like digital empathy. You know, like you get into a Twitter fight with someone, and you can see that information from their smartwatch was that they were at an extremely elevated heart rate, and that they've got you know some other problems going on. You're like, okay, well, I can see where this person's coming from. Like they're obviously upset, and I think we could be you know, sort of fingerprinting our information, our content um, in ways that improve that experience too. Better language translation helps us actually break down barriers, break down borders. Um, and that could be another step towards, you know, sort of a digital empathy or digital telepathy where we can communicate more readily and more immediately with other people. Obviously not for next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what can happen but next year? You know what can happen next year, speaking of language translation, and I'm calling you out, YouTube. Please, even if I have to pay $10 a month, um, if you can give me a transcription to different languages and I can share that with whether people who speak Spanish, German, or Chinese, and my channel, that would be fantastic because you can do that. What are you doing? Sam, 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 what Sam, are you Sam. doing? Me, I thought I went to <laughs> <laughs> random as hell. I thought I hated myself, man. Sorry about this. Uh, um, no, but, but they can. And I, I mean, if you offer it as a service, I will pay for it. And well, no, you, you can, you can, they do, they do offer it in there. They, they do offer third party services in there to do that for you. You can order through yeah. YouTube. And you, but you, what you could also do. Is um there's a community um um feature that you can use that users from your community can translate it for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know what you mean, but I'm just saying that. Look, you offer it as a package service, right? Making YouTube better, right? That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, Jamie. but they're gonna automate that, and we ought to see automated captions worked out. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, captions are not bad at all. Yeah, they've actually. Yeah. I've, I've used the automated. Yeah, the captions are still kind of. I mean, yeah, but automated, look, I get it. Automated will not be perfect. And, but if you have a service and you automate it, which means you also, since you're paying, somebody will have to cross check each batch as they move out. Um, then yeah, I mean, I'm just saying ways to improve YouTube. 
That's just yeah. what it is. That would be a nice way. And that's or, something that will help a lot of YouTubers expand the audience as well. Or, or and, and this is something I wanted to ask you guys, because it was just sort of a general news piece, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on it. But um, what about the potential for competition in 2018 from, from YouTube? I don't feel Facebook has really risen to the occasion in providing tools and monetization for their creators. But we've been seeing Amazon uh taking up uh what, what do you call it? the the trademarking on open yeah. tube or amazon tube uh trying it's coming if, god if anyone i do on, not care coming. if they have money and they're willing to share some of with me to shoot videos out i don't care what the competition is as long as it exists <laughs> like, no I, I, they need well, because the fear, the fear I have is 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 now it's Google versus Facebook versus Amazon, the three companies, the three biggest companies most responsible yeah, for trafficking and, they, they, and profiting off of user data. But is this an enemy and uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation? It, it definitely it is. is. It is. And, well, somebody uh, needs to smack YouTube, and it can't be just sponsors because they remember they only respond when advertisers pull shit out. It, especially with YouTube kids, should tell you that they don't only respond when that, uh, on those things. So yeah. to see somebody, the best thing for them would be for somebody like an Amazon going and said, "Oh, we're gonna do this too, and we're gonna make this a little bit better, and we're gonna make sure we and we and we're gonna make sure we're gonna have some good." Uh, ways for creators to make money and we're going to make sure these certain things sort of happen and put that competition against them will be the best for YouTube because that will force them to do things properly and that will force them to innovate a platform well instead of sitting on their laurels and saying, well, we're the number one in town, so we can just experiment and do whatever we want to do. And if something's broken, we'll just ignore, 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 ignore. And, oh, wait a minute, large sponsors pulling out. Okay, we'll go ahead and attend to this now. And we'll we'll make drastic steps and changes and be able to do those things. So that, like 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 the thing with YouTube kids, none of that would have happened in terms of them hiring more people, looking at more. Articles. None of that would have happened if you did not hear three of the biggest sponsors and advertisers that they have pulling out of not just YouTube but Yo. out of Google. Period. Until then. So when they put that out there, it was like nice to hear YouTube, but you, you did not react because you're a user base. You did not react because you created. You reacted because a billion dollar businesses were pulling money out of you. Yeah, I think um, I think with Amazon, Amazon will it's coming. We know it's coming. It's going to be big. But I think what a lot of people forget to look at with the full venture of what Amazon is. Amazon will provides two things. One, it means for any sponsor, even advertiser, it's direct market to sale, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not just throwing ads. You're throwing ads directly to buy your products. That's the first thing. Um, also, for influencers, it's also quite easy, especially with us in tech. It's much easier to transition uh, in that market. But I think also the other thing I wanted to add is that I think Amazon had the best year ever. We can call it out now that... Uh, they literally dominated 2017. They bought Whole Foods, and in no short time, they integrated that into Amazon Fresh. Um, they, um, you know, what else did they? They bought something else this year, I believe, right? I don't if remember. I I, They're dominating on the uh, on 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 the streaming oh, service yeah. space. Yes, yeah, stream, streaming services. Oh, um, they have no those. space in that. They they, they, they smart speakers that dominated smart speakers, with the Echo Alexa and Echo um, and also that. again, I mean, the traditional um, marketplace, which is a lot of buying and selling. Uh, Black Friday was so big that. Uh, Bezos became the richest man at least for a day because of one day in sales in Black Friday. He had a hundred billion dollars in worth. That's how much they dominated this year. They literally just said, we are going to take over the world. And I mean, we live in an Amazon world now, pretty yeah. much. Uh, the funny thing is, is this is the first year that I feel like their sales and things on the product side of things are really starting to make that revenue and money for them because what they were big off of was they were the first to jump into web services with AWS and that's what really shot their money up and shot their shot their their, their spacing up and um, AWS is getting challenged now by Google and um, and uh, Microsoft, Microsoft yeah. some of that space but AWS is such a dominant platform um, and so many people <laughs> use it I mean so many services use that platform. It'll be really interesting to see uh, come next year uh, what, how 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 all that cloud stuff works out. 
in terms of the competition will they be able to catch up and take a little bit of the space out there it's almost like it's almost like windows versus every other operating system out there where they have such a dominant space that can can anyone come in there and chip a little away from them or chip enough you away know, to the be funny thing about that too is i think next year with i mean you are right with aws but also if you go back to uh amazon video or whatever their service is going to be called for yeah. uh, that competes against YouTube. I mean, that's going to be running on AWS Backbone, and that yeah. is going to play a big role again in expanding that. You know, mm -hmm. basically saying, "Look, we are going to adopt everyone on YouTube, and we can do it because we have this backbone that can actually push out." I think it's going to be interesting once they launch that service and how that competes, and then also how Facebook now counter reacts as well, um, mm -hmm. because we know that's what Facebook uh, Facebook does a good job in reacting in, in certain environments. Yeah. And then we'll oh, see how well YouTube, I just had, old I just, granddaddy. I just you know, had a thought. Yeah. Of, well, they're already throwing, already throwing physical product links inside of like videos and stuff that's below it. I've seen that around, yeah. so they're prepared oh. for it. But the, here's what's really interesting: it's when this platform launches, it's the, the tech, the tech folks will we'll already jump over because it's new shiny tech thing. We're we're going over there. That's just what we'll, we'll, we'll all just do that just because we know how it works and, and we, we know a lot of the products and stuff the review can be directly sold off of there and it just it's it's a it's a nice it's a nice mechanism for for generating some type of some revenue within there. The beauty bloggers, when they decide to jump, it's gonna and be if epic. they jump into that space, <laughs> with, wow. That's where YouTube has to be super concerned because if they go, eh, we'll just go over to the beauty space here when we can sell our products directly and it offers a vertical for them to then sell maybe their own branded products directly through Amazon as well too because you know even, even think about that that we all have brands here. And let's say Amazon's Amazon's good at white labeling things, and they want to, you know, they contact you know us, and they want to make you know the Hangouts pair of headphones or whatever the case may be, and and we could sell that directly while live streaming from whatever you know AWS or Amazon Open yeah. Video Service that happens at the same time, so people can purchase whatever whatever products and things we pitch and we want to go through there at the same time. It just there's a there is a huge wave of competition coming that I think Google's aware of on YouTube, but I do not think they take it as serious as they should. I think they're kind of sitting back. We'll just wait to see how the hit is. I say, I, I'm, I'm not one for waiting to get punched. Usually in a fight, you, especially in competition, you're, the idea is to not get hit. That's why Floyd Mayweather is 50 and 0. 51 and 0. There's a reason he avoids getting hit. It's kind of the idea, and um, it seems like Google's just like, "Come at me, bro." And um, well, and and I, well, that's just it. Is I don't think Google is come at me. I think Google has their sights set on being another version of cable. They want really bad idea. content. They want uh, sort of vetted content from major studios, stuff that had money poured into it. And that YouTube is really, I think, a loss leader for them in being another arm of search. So again, as you go through and you search their YouTube videos, they collect data on you and that helps them serve up ads. So they they use YouTube as a way to fund other, other endeavors, uh, fill other endeavors with information. They don't fund anything off of YouTube. So they're not really looking to pour a ton of investment into improving YouTube, but who can also utilize user data to, to better serve ads and to better sell products is Amazon. And so Amazon makes the most sense because they're not going to try, like they don't, they're not going to have the same problem that Vessel had or that uh, um, vid.me where they were trying to make a video streaming platform from the ground up that could actually pay for itself. They can't. But Facebook can use you can mine for user data. YouTube can mine for user data, and an open Amazon tube can mine for user data. So they can they can use that in another way as a way to sell other products and services. Mm -hmm. So that that's why I think the the potential for competition makes sense from a company like Amazon. Um, I'll, I'll be curious to see if it actually is executed next year, or if we just see something like, "Oh, we're going to make Twitch better." <laughs> I can see if that mm -hmm. if that actually works. But we we have a huge user base on YouTube that's really pissed off. And your point on beauty bloggers, lifestyle uh, lifestyle video creators, vloggers, and especially going back to Sam's point about YouTube for kids, 
don't we think Amazon's going to come out the gate with something that they learned from those mistakes while Google has their sites set on YouTube TV, YouTube Red, things like that. They don't have their sites oh, on the YouTube actually music service. improving the, the, the service for smaller content creators. They have their sites set on being a bigger distribution channel like Netflix. And that's where they're going to get hammered with this if we can see Amazon mount some real competition. Yeah, I mean, speaking of Netflix, and thank you for bringing that up. I think one of the other things in 2018 is we are going to see the proliferation of just some very interesting content material on streaming networks. Netflix included um, uh, as one of the major spearheads. Uh, the fact that um, now you have, I think, I think you know, for the creative side and being either a writer, uh, if you have a script idea, you know, it, being in that Hollywood creative side, there is now an avenue to say, hey, I have an idea. I've had this idea for a long time. Uh, I can definitely make a show or movie for it now. You know, it's not like before where you had the, uh, the more rigid structure of studios, networks and things like that. And I think because users and most people are cutting the cord, and we talked about cutting the cord in, 2017, 2018, it's going to move to the next extent. You're going to see just original content spearhead more in, I think, in 2018 uh, across different networks, uh, be it um, uh, Netflix, you know, be it Hulu, even um, even CBS All Access that has you know uh, Star Trek um, um, Discovery. I think you're going to see a lot of that come through um, and. Going back to YouTube is, I don't think they have the right vision for exactly what that kind of content is going against these kind of big juggernauts because I don't think they understand that um, when you go into that realm, nobody wants user-generated content. We want a polished show. We want something that looks like, you know, we all, when Star Trek Discovery was first, you know, we saw the first hints, we were all complaining. I mean, I complained too. And then we saw the show, we're like, oh man, you guys spent money. Thank you. Okay, I am watching this, <laughs> you know? And YouTube, I don't think has understood that fact that when you go to the TV RAM or you're gonna compete in that RAM, even if you're using user generated, uh, indiv I mean, uh, individuals from a smaller basis, you must put the money to make it feel like, um, you know, this is the next bit, best thing because you're gonna have that kind of competition. And I think, that arena is going to change because um, we are seeing a lot of just different types of shows and movies and things like that. Like the movie Bright, go watch it. It's great. Don't mind everybody else. I just had to do that plug in because I'm tired of people saying that movie sucks because they're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. wow. If you don't agree with me, then you're. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, nah, but yeah, no, you, you guys are right. There's just so much coming up cut cutting and the whole idea of YouTube beginning to feel as though, like I said, they, they feel, it feels as though they've lost a step. You know, it feels as though they're no longer the innovators that they used to be. And they need, they, they definitely need an answer to the Titans that, are, that they're going to be facing up against um, in 2018 because everyone's going to be gunning for that, like, YouTube space in 2018. And if, if Amazon can grab it, oh boy, I, I, I think Amazon would rise quickly uh, above the rank. I think right now, like, is there even a, um, uh, who's the number two when it comes to streaming content right now? Uh, isn't that like Facebook? I mean, what my streaming content as in... Well, it depends on what we're defining streaming content. If it's like sort of studio like, produced style content. No, no, no. no, no you can create it. You can generate content. I, I would be willing to bet it's Facebook. Yeah. Probably yeah. Facebook. Yeah. yeah. And you see, you see, the answer is like probably Facebook. Like, just imagine if we finally get an answer like, oh, it's Amazon and they're gaining next year. That would definitely put the well, at least one nail in the coffin of uh, Google's dominance in that space. So they, they have to, I mean, well, YouTube's I, well, dominance in that space. So they have to pay attention. Well, I, I already think if that if, if Amazon comes off firing on all cylinders and it's looking real good, they are going to lose significant market share that they're not going to be able to necessarily yeah. get back. And it's just going to be that nail that it took because people are frustrated to the point that they're just going to jump just because they want to stick it to Google, not necessarily because Amazon will be that much better. It'll, they'll just want to get away from them or will want to 
be on Amazon side to try and take Google down or something like that. Because the one other big thing has been the, obviously the demonetization and the way they've handled that. I don't think it's it it it's in the tech space. It's it's hit us, but not at the heavy handed level that it's hit other 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 genres out there that have been getting demonetized. The worst we got was the whole iPhone the iPhone disabled thing, which was iPhone X unboxings getting disabled, which was pure stupidity beyond that. But um, it shows you how broken the algorithm really is. Um, but other people have been dealing with that demonetization issue. That's been going on not just this year, not just the year before, but it's been going on for, for at least the last three years or so of people complaining about this auto demonetization and these things happening to their channels. And Google yeah. has not put any real good solid answer out there as to why and because we all know that rev you know if ads aren't playing and, and views are coming in revenue isn't coming in at the same time there's a huge chance for a loss of revenue that way that that even if they put the ads back on people are losing tons of money or thousands of dollars that they could have earned with it because YouTube messed up an algorithm because they went heavy handed on things or I mean, yeah, you, you make the most money in the first 24 hours now on YouTube. That's just yeah. Good, so. yeah. And that's that's right. Prime when your video is most likely to be demonetized. Yeah. <laughs> I yep. saw somebody yesterday said that he's like he was uploading his video and as it was uploading, he got demonetized. Yeah. Don't, don't nail you. It's he's like, it's like you guys, have you finished scanning? It's uploaded. It's not even there. <laughs> These are like 10 seconds of the video, like, nah, like nah, the title nah. of the video is Everything is Beautiful and People are Lovely. And YouTube was like, No, <laughs> <laughs> demonetize. demonetize. Uh, all right, guys, I think we've, we've done quite a bit in our wrap up, and I look forward to 2018. Um, I want to thank everyone this year for watching. Appreciate guys for chiming in the chat. It's always fun to have you guys, uh, as always. Um, thank you, uh, Juan. Uh, thank you, uh, Warren. Thank you, Sam, uh, for, of course, being lovely hosts. Uh, we will continue again next year. Uh, season five of the show. We've been uh, doing which, this for a while, guys. I'm, yeah. I'm really proud of us. I think 2017, a, a great success was us keeping it together. <laughs> Despite <laughs> incredible odds. Yes, yes. 2018, the um, goal should be to find a better better service to do this with. It's the better service. Um, there are a couple of things I am going to do on my side in 2018, uh, since I didn't do it effectively this this year. I, I promise that it will be available as an audio podcast on both iTunes and Google Play, uh, starting from the very first show, uh, which would be on the... Actually, it's not even next week, right? Twenty third. <laughs> the twenty third. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was like, wait, wait, no, it's actually. Yeah, gonna gonna go to hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, yeah. let me. That's December. Hold on a second. The twentieth, most likely. Yeah, our first show will be on the twentieth of of January, uh, because we're off, we're off for two weeks for CES because everyone's yeah. traveling on. We'll all be traveling both those Saturdays. Saturdays, yes. Yeah. So, um, we we will have. Uh, audio podcast. Uh, we will also try and look for better ways to improve our audio and video. Um, you know, maybe look for a different platform to do this and then upload. We'll look at different avenues, but it still will be here on YouTube so you guys can watch and chime in and we'll let you know ahead of time. Uh, before we finish up, I uh, just want to, of course, do our usual roundup of what we have on the channels right now and what we can expect come next week because yes next week we'll still be making videos so i'm going to start off with you mr juan magnell so uh pocket now we just finally got our review out on the axon m that kind of just fell uh, in between the cracks on all of our year-end coverage but that's finally out now uh on my personal channel i I've, I've had a couple political vlogs up about tech and politics i'm going to be following up on some of those stories wrapping up the year especially as we get through things like loot boxes and gaming and uh, net neutrality but i'm also looking at trying to revisit uh some videos too like uh uh, I, I want to. I've been spending a little time with my Lumia 1020, just uh, no. whether or not a camera like this can still exist, it can still compete against newer performers. And then uh, I want to say it was about three or four years ago I produced a video comparing smartphones to DSLRs. Is that you remember that was like a thing that people kept doing? Like, yeah. oh my god, is, is this phone as good as a real camera? Um, so I'm going to revisit that concept too, in light of all of these phones that now have like software bokeh modes and things like that. 
Um, so that'll be uh, that'll be out probably. I, I'm going to try and shoot it and get it out before CES, but I don't know if I'll be able to cobble that all together. Uh, we just had another episode of the Geek Book Club uh, broadcast. You can subscribe to that podcast on iTunes and Google Play. And we talked about a book from Cory Doctorow dealing with government paranoia and terrorism. And it's a young adult novel and you can pick it up for free. He actually released it under a Creative Commons uh, copyright, so you can pick it up for free. And lastly, I just want to throw a little plug out to a Reddit experiment that me and a couple friends are trying to start. Um, it's a subreddit called Glowing Rectangles, and uh, it's a place for people to share content from smaller producers. So, you know, if you go to our Android, you're going to see a ton of links from The Verge and MKBHD and people who have built up some amazing fan bases. But it's not always the best place to try and find new, smaller, up and coming uh, content producers and bloggers. And so uh, we're going to try and resurrect this Reddit community and see if we can use it as a platform for discovery and to celebrate the producers that we we all know and love who don't get enough exposure. And that's Reddit r slash glowing rectangles. Uh, we've already got a couple posts up there for some really great people. And um I, I hope you guys will check it out and share and upvote and uh, contribute to that community too. Sweet. That sounds cool. Sam will be there because he's the only one on our team on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn. That means it's true, though. I, mean, I, I, I use the Reddit. Yeah. Um, Warren, how about you? So. I've been so swamped with the holidays, work, and everything else, and building this damn computer. As you've, you've, I've gone, you've heard me go through the trial of the tribulation, especially with that damn case, I had the change. Um, that I'll, I'll probably, I don't have anything right now, but next week there'll be a starting of the new year. It's going to be like a content bomb of things, just just all videos, maybe one or two videos a day of just stuff that backlog that I want to release out there leading up into CES and obviously CES videos coming up the following week, week after that. Um, I'm in, in also in the process of possibly creating a different channel on some different topics that I'm sort of working through right now. Don't have anything to announce just yet, but uh, something new could be starting up soon as I kind of work through that. But um, that's pretty much all that I have. Cool. Um, on my end, uh, I, I have a few videos from before Christmas till, till now. Um, I have my review of Bright. Uh, Go check it out. Like I said, go watch the movie since I said I liked it. So, I mean, that's that's the final word. Um, <laughs> I also have a sponsored video uh, from Samsung with smart things, uh, basically using that in my home. I've been using smart things for quite a bit of time. So, um, you know, it was actually fun to actually do this video and shoot it that way. Uh, I'd love you guys to check it out. Let me know what you think of the style because I'm trying to do different styles for different video sets. Um, Adam, Adam Goud did a, an impressions of the Mi Mix 2, which has some really, really thin bezels and probably one of the biggest screen to body ratios. Uh, we did our Flashpoint 45 day review on the iPhone X. So if you're looking to pick up the device and wondering how it would be after someone has used it for more than 30 days, definitely check that out. For more than a week. <laughs> uh, we have our best gaming headset edition for 2017. Uh, five gaming headsets in that. And surprisingly, all of them are under 150 bucks. So, Impressive. Yeah, um, definitely check that out. And finally, I deemed my best smartphone camera of 2017 is a Pixel 2. Um, you could not watch the video since I said that's the best camera, but you could check it out to see some of the images uh, that we captured with it and how I came to that conclusion of why I think it's the best camera, both front and back, for a smartphone. Um, next week, I will be dropping my review on the 49-inch monitor. Um, so if you want to check that out, um, that will be up sometime next week. And then I'm also doing a review of um, a little eGPU. It's really small. It's about this big. Um, and I think that, and it's funny now I remember that, but I think that will change the way uh, we deal with um, things like surfaces and thin ultrabooks come next year. Because... Uh, well, I Sorry? Speak, speaking of that, uh, one of my friends just got a eGPU and he's absolutely sold on it, especially for LAN partying. He was absolutely sold on it. 
Yeah, I am too. I am. I'll, I'll, I'll put this out now. The only problem I have with it is Adobe and it's, they don't support stuff well. So I really can't edit video properly, but I can game like hell on that thing. So you'll see it next week um, at some point in time. Um, other than that, it will be CES. So we will all will be at the show at, at some capacity. So definitely check out all the channels. Um, starting off with Mr. Uh, Juan Bagdell. You can find him on Some Gadget Guy. That is his channel on YouTube. He also hosts a show on Newegg. Um, and uh, that's on Thursdays on Newegg's channel. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It is Some Gadget Guy. And uh, his videos are now on his... Um, Movie videos are, I can't remember where. Where is it again? Oh, yeah. So we're, we we just resurrected another episode of Movies You May Have Missed. And I want to throw a special plug to archive.org. They're doing a fundraising drive. And Archive's mission is one that I feel is vitally important in this era of fake news where they're literally backing up the internet. Um, so if you have the means and you're looking for a cause to contribute to, I would wholeheartedly recommend chipping a couple dollars to archive. Uh, they're a phenomenal resource for looking at the history of how content has been produced on the internet. And plus, they've got a ton of really cool, like old public domain videos and movies and audio recordings. And they're a treasure trove of content to chew through. So uh, please, please, please con uh, continue supporting them because they're also the only site that we can upload this movie podcast to. <laughs> cool. And uh, you can also check out and follow Mr. Warren Bowman from BW1.com. That is his YouTube channel. His website is also BW1.com. And you can follow him on all his social media outlets, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. He doesn't use Snapchat. It is BW1.com. You'll never find me on Snapchat. <laughs> And of course, the, we have Sam, who is part of the Border Work Network. Uh, you can find his videos there on Border Work, as well as also follow him on Twitter. It is Black Iron underscore Man, and um, yeah, you know he's also on Facebook. But I have not given his Facebook page. Oh, heck no. Yeah, I think Instagram is the real. Uh... Black Iron Man, I believe. Yeah, it's the real Black Iron Man on Instagram because there's a fake one running out there. There's, there's a fake one running out there, man. You gotta, you gotta make sure you get the right Iron Man. You gotta make sure. Be you get careful, the right kids. One. Be careful, kids. And of course, it's Border Work here on my side uh, on YouTube. Uh, the website is Border Work. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook is also Border Work. Thank you very much, guys. If you are in the Northeast, stay warm. It is cold. It is freezing. Very um, cold. <laughs> otherwise, uh, have a very happy new year. Celebrate safely. Get back safely so we can see you on the 20th of January, I believe, is the date. And the show will be mm -hmm. back for season five. We'll be all here and we are ready to roll. So enjoy your entertainment. Bang.